Well, it's always a joy to be here with you. Uh, probably there's always new people, and the ones that have been here before uh, that you've heard me share, you realize we're in for a little suffering in Jesus' name. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> years ago, somebody heard me sharing. They said, you know, you ought to be announced when you start teaching, let the beatings begin. I... <laughs> Sorry about that. I cannot, on behalf of all the leaders, really from around the world, that we're here, I don't know how deeply uh, this congregation understands the hospitality and the significance of the hospitality of Sojourn Church. I mean, you guys, uh, uh, Rana and the staff, uh, Terry talked about uh, the rain, and I mean, it was crazy to see how totally uh, in charge the same set of people were about serving us in that unnecessary or unwelcome burden. But Terry and Susan and your leadership, and obviously behind all that's Dudley and Betsy and others, particularly them. If you don't know the halls, there's a picture of godly people right there. Um, I had an encounter with Jesus in December of 1967. And uh, Jesus rudely interrupted my trip. Uh, now, trip was a word that was from the 60s, so I've dated, <laughs> dated myself right there. But I have to I was backslidden, but I'd backslidden far enough. I was not looking for Jesus. Uh, I remember that song, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places. Can I get a witness? <laughs> and... Uh, I am a strange duck. My wife has finished off, you know, confirming that point of reality. But uh, I'm an all-in or not in kind of a personality. And uh, to the, my shame, uh, I actually said to the Lord my senior year in high school, I can't follow you until I know what's in the world. And Jesus didn't faint. Uh, and because he knows the end from the beginning. How many of you know he knows the end from the beginning? For me, having a very severe case of the need to know. Is there anybody else in here that has the need to know? Jesus knowing that that was what I chose and he frequently makes room for you to do what you chose. Uh, he let me go. And of course, I got deeply into the world. And I was in Berkeley in the 60s, and you had to have been there. I mean, it was a crazy, it was like the best of times and worst of times for anybody that had my disease. And uh, we were aware that uh, in what we were doing and learning and being a part of, that we were changing the world. I don't know if anybody else here has been in, in a movement, the civil rights movement, what the enlivening of the students, the student movement was global. And uh, it was amazing to be aware that you were involved in something like that. And I pray that all of us will have the opportunity to experience that in the kingdom of God. Obviously, what we were doing was not in the kingdom of God, but God always uses what's going on in the world to move his purposes down the road. Um, when I did encounter Jesus, uh, one of the things that happened to me uh, as I got into the Word, uh, my intellectual background, as was my dear wife, Jen, stand up, just wave and stand up and say hello. <clears throat> my, my intellectual background, which was not just a passion, it was life. Uh, I didn't study, I ate. Uh, I ate information uh, and consumed it. And my background was in what we call political economics. It was a 
mixture of history and a mixture of economics and a mixture of, of uh, social systems and all that stuff. So that when I came to the Word and came to the Scripture, and I didn't have mentors around me. Uh, it, you know, Jan and I, a number of us were arrested by Jesus, and we didn't have people around us. And so when I read the Bible, I read the Bible as a political economist, because that is the way I had been intellectually trained. Some of you have heard me before, I talk about magic glasses, that God, at, at some point, I jumped right in, which is uh, my nature. But at some point, you, need, you will, if you've not yet, you will begin to read the Bible out of the engiftment and calling that God has given to you. You watch. You will. And uh, so I've kind of backed into the basics I immediately went for, okay, what's the big idea? I, I obviously, Lord, I know you exist. I believe you that you love me. I understand sin. You don't have to convince me. Been there, done that. So my intellectual training was always looking for what is the main idea? Where is this thing going? God, what is it you want and, of course, I didn't, I'm, Lord, help me be careful here. I didn't get that much help from the church. I didn't get that much help from the church because my discovery was that there did not seem to be that many leaders who really had the big idea. Now, I'm not trying to set myself apart or anything like that at all. I'm just saying that from uh, my point of view, and I, I think many people's point of view, uh, Jesus died to bring me to heaven was not a very motivating statement. I mean, really? Uh, a creator who is capable of creating something with the complexity and the grandeur uh, of all the things that God is and what he's done Really? I mean, he died so I could go to heaven? And then when I'd listen to what heaven was about, frankly, I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go to heaven. It sounded like the most boring condemnation. I mean, really? I do love you. I love people. I want to hear your testimonies. I want to hear everybody's testimony, but not forever. Hope I, I don't want to hurt your feelings. God loves you. I love you. All that good stuff. But after we've, we've shared testimonies for a couple million years, we might get bored. And then this picture of what appeared to me to be some kind of a modified Ku Klux Klan floating around in white sheets, I, I just couldn't get any sense of excitement about it. Uh, you know, it made me want, I'm being a little silly, but I did want, what is the alternative? And I didn't get too much help on that either. But what I do understand now a little bit is that the analogy uh, that Jesus said, except you be born again, uh, you, can't, you can't engage me, uh, I think that's a perfect, as in all of what Jesus said, a perfect picture of where this thing is. Now, I could call what I'm going to share a case of mistaken identity. I could talk, talk about uh, Satan is crazy but very intelligent. Uh, there's a lot of ways I could talk about where I think this thing is, and we need to be clear. But when we are born again, we really are spiritual babies. It's a perfect analogy for where we are. And unfortunately, most of the body of Christ is not growing up. We are still relating as spiritual babies and children. I'm not quite sure why that has been permitted to last as long as it has. 
I am not saying that people have not understood purposes and there haven't been deep Christians. Obviously, they have. But the my experience, 48 years into this thing of working in the church, my experience is far too many Christians really don't have a clue about what God is really up to and how much beyond going to heaven this thing is about. And what I, you know, I'm slow. Uh, Jesus reminds me, sometimes the Holy Spirit affectionately calls me dummy. And uh, when that happens, I know the Holy Spirit is talking to me. Uh, how many of you know God frequently talks to you in your own language? He never uses King James English with me. I'm just, I'm not... <laughs> Not a King James English guy. But here's what I have come to understand. Is that when we are born again, God's main purpose is to love us. It's in the same, in the same way that, you know, isn't he cute? Isn't she cute? Yes, she poops her diapers, but that's part of being a little kid. That's part of being a baby. And in a very same sense... Our level of understanding what God wants with us for saving us is on the same level of a little child. And in the beginning of it, it's all about establishing his love relationship with us. That we can trust him as a good father. We can trust him as a good uh, uh, provider. And that is what God does in exactly the same way loving parents take care of a young child. That is how the Holy Spirit uh, touches all of us and, and keeps us in that place until we become secured. Now, I have noticed in the Jesus movement, which Jan and I were a part of, really, and that's when the draft the, there was a Holy Ghost draft, as in military draft in the spirit, in the 60s and 70s in our draft. Our, our music was not like music now. We sang the Psalms. And so much so that when I read, and I, I'm always circulating through Proverbs in the Psalms, I hear all these songs that we used to sing in the 60s and 70s, and none of them were about us. They were all about Jesus and as what the Psalms, we created music out of the Psalms and I really miss it. And what I have noticed in the, especially the last 20 years is all our music now is more than anything else, baby music, if I love it, but it's baby music in the sense it's all about us. God loves me. It's like God is having to re-secure the current generations in the same way you would re-secure a child, which is not helping us in some ways because we are spiritual children in being engaged in a spiritual war that is beginning to really heighten on the earth right now. And it's a time when we don't we don't need a lot of babies. We need some mature men and women who can be engaged by the Holy Spirit on behalf of what God's purpose for the nations and he, even indeed for the whole church. And that is that we would grow up. Now, all of us have a problem, beginning with me. I don't want to grow up. I have had a manner way back when, a man named Bob Mumford was a gift. He used to say, we don't grow up because we want to, we grow up because we have to. And that made perfect sense to me uh, because I understood a measure of why we have to grow up. Now, the P Paul in Romans 8 and now I'm going to speak to those of you that are familiar and just for the sake of time. In Romans 8, 17 to 22, right in that section, he zeroes in on what God's purpose for saving you is about. And on one level, it's going to sound like Star Wars. 
Uh, it shouldn't, it should sound like common understanding, but he actually created you and I not only to dwell within us so that wherever we live in the universe is irrelevant. It, it so happens we will live on a recreated earth and what we call heaven uh, and earth will fuse and merge in a way that they are separated now. But in the future and eternity, there will be a new heaven and a new earth where that spirit realm has fused with the material world. Now, you should have been told that in a perfect world, probably about the time you were 10 years old, if we use the natural child analogy, by the time you're nine or 10, in the same way that you would be teaching your children about this is what life is about, this is the purposes of God, et cetera, et cetera. There should have been a time in a perfect world where you would have been introduced into why God created you and what he actually wants to do through you. Can I get a witness? Yeah. Now, Again, using the born again analogy, Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30, this is Peacock translation, if you're tired of getting the hell beat out of you, I have a different road you can take. <laughs> now, King James said it, come unto me all ye that labor and have had the snot beat. No, it doesn't say that. But that really is what the scripture is saying. If you've had enough, why don't you come to me and engage what I'm doing because I will show you what your real identity is, not this fake identity that you've been confused and living in up to this point in time. Now, I love to listen to people's <laughs> testimonies especially the ones that give me the holy routine. Uh, they're always kind of talking in holy language and it, my experience was this. My experience, Tell the truth, you lying dog. You finally had, were convinced that your stupidity had overwhelmed you. Yeah, come on. I, at this point in my life, you know you get 75, you can do what you want. I enjoy calling uh, free truth zones in the church. I probably have offended some of you already because I implicitly believe the church has got to be the place where we tell the truth. If we can't tell the truth in here, we have no hope. So the truth being that most of us came to Jesus in an emergency of some sort, unless you were, had a godly family and you know there, that does happen. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> it's a law of probability. It's probability theory that actually worked out. <clears throat> but here's the interesting thing that he says. He says, once you decided that you've had enough, and that was really what happened to me when I encountered Jesus, I realized I was incapable of managing my life. I had tapped out. I'm not big enough, tough enough, or smart enough to manage my life. And if you want to do it, take a shot. Because I've proven that I can't do it. And then he says, if you really want to know me, which he did not say, I'll move you from point A to point B in the universe. I'll take you from earth to heaven. He said, if you want to know me, it's really complex. Stick your head in my yoke and work with me. He didn't say go to church. I love church. Give my life to the church. But he did not say, go to church. He said, engage me and what I'm doing 
And if you engage me and what I'm doing, you will come to know me. Now, if the center line of this whole thing is not engaging Jesus, then I don't know what the center line is. Get in a room with a bunch of theologians. We go here, we go there, we go all over the place. At this point, to me, the game is really simple. I want to engage Jesus in what he is doing because that is the purpose of the gospel. With all the rest of it being said. So when I see a church that is constantly having to be reinforced, God loves me, God is good, it tells me something about the maturity level of what is going on in that context. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying in all our lives in Christ, a time must come in the same way that when we engage somebody that's five or six, we say, you need to go to school. School begins. When my mom told me I needed to go to school, I was in my Indian identity wearing a breech cloth. I'm serious, and I didn't trust the white man. I've learned that was good insight. <laughs> I was literally in a deer skin working on my canoe down on the property, and Mom said, Dennis, you have to go to school. And I said, are there going to be girls there? She said, well, there was, I don't want to go. <laughs> girls don't want to build teepees. I never met a girl that wanted to do be an Indian. But I'm saying this, am I making any sense? There's a time when God begins to say, look, we're going to grow up because I've secured you enough in love and I've secured you enough that you can trust me, which is critical. So now we're going to have to begin to grow up and I'm going to have to tell you why I saved you and I didn't save you to make you happy. I didn't save you to remove trouble from your life. As a matter of fact, trouble is a tool I use and will use to grow you up. Now, if you don't understand this, when the Holy Spirit begins to bring trouble in your life, you'll probably get into deliverance or some other phenomena where you blame Satan for everything that's going on that's tough. I'm glad the Holy Spirit has thick skin because I've rebuked him more than once. And I guarantee you, so have you. We pray against the very things God has allowed or our stupidity produced Take your pick, okay? Cut yourself slack or deal with the truth. Satan is not involved in that except to make you think that that situation is bad for you instead of something that will finally goad you into growing up and stop doing dumb things. Amen? I pray that when we pray, and I love what you do here praying, I pray that a lot of those prayers are, Lord, show this person what you're doing through this problem. Amen. To remove the problem is to remove the lesson. I think I'll say that twice. <laughs> to remove the problem is frequently, not always, but frequently to move the process of growing up farther away so that you have to go all the way back to square one. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I can trust him. I can. Please, please let that get deep enough in you that, that God can bring you into other stuff based on the security that you have in his process in your life. 
because the lessons that are beyond that, the lessons that he will take you into after his love for you is established are critical lessons to the living out of what God created you to be and do. Ephesians 2.10 says that God designed you before you were created and gave you a mission. And you will not be able to get to your mission if he has to keep taking you back to I love you, I love you, you can trust me, blah, 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 because you'll hit stuff that you'll be rebuking as the devil or you'll walk away from instead of walking into. There is a spiritual war that's been going on before any of us got here, way back, maybe even before matter was created. And that war, and the group, statesman group here, that was here, that war is intensifying and I'm sure the spiritual enemies of Christ in the spirit realm, the principalities, powers, and dominions, Ephesians 6, 12. Some of you know what I just said. I'm sure they're feeling pretty good right now because they're not stupid and they assess where the church is at and to the degree that we still have got masses of believers that still are clinging to the foundation and still have not actually come to believe that God loves them and are secured in that, and to believe that God is in your life when bad stuff happens, and to believe and understand that this is not about just making us feel secured it is about making us vehicles through which God can live and operate and change the world. Now, some of you hearing somebody talk like me are saying, what is this guy saying? It doesn't make me feel good. Doesn't make me feel good at all. It's a little bit like a drill sergeant who's saying to the new recruits, I know your mother loves you and I don't care. <laughs> and if, if the Holy Spirit has not secured me enough, I will not, the Lord because he does love me, will not take me into deep water because he knows I can't swim in deep water. But when you come into a crisis that is brewing, you know, uh, Gerald Chester, a dear friend of mine, many of obviously you know him. We are out, I can't say we were playing golf, we were playing golf. There's a gulf between what we were doing and golf. <laughs> But we were commenting on 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, and there's a lot more I could say, but we never imagined we'd have gay marriage. Now, actually, that one doesn't surprise me. But I'll tell you what surprises me. That phenomena is now going after children in our public schools so that last week we had a nine-year-old commit suicide over insecurity as to what gender he was. Now, I never imagined, Dudley, I never imagined in my lifetime in the America that I was born into back there that we would see a situation where the enemy of our children is boldly passing legislation 
that makes it unlawful for people to deal with that. In California right now, we got a bill which demands that minors under 16 can have sex change operations paid for by the state without the parents having to know. Now you, listen, you know I knew things were getting bad. I came to Texas. We had counted, a bunch of us saw that'll never happen in Texas. I can't believe Texas to me is a barometer or a thermometer or a measuring stick. When that kind of stuff goes on in Texas, and I guarantee you it's coming to you. And we were here with a number of folks, some of whom are still here from the Latin world. And in the Latin world, they're saying, like heck, you're not going to do that in our schools. And it's bringing together for the first time in history, the Catholic Church and the Protestants who are willing to fight for the family and saying that is not going to happen in our nations. They were sitting in your seats where you are right now. Now, you're not going to get a set of spiritual warriors capable of dealing with that level of warfare with a bunch of kids who still have to be reassured that Jesus loves them and that, the, that God will take you out of any really heavy-duty stuff that is designed to grow you up. I find it amusing. We like to look at the the Navy SEALs and, you know, there's so much media right now about warriors who are this or that. I wonder, what is that? What, what is that saying to the culture that we would, you know, be so interested and worship those people as heroes and not get the connection that those kinds of people are made? Those are people who have gone through training where people loved them enough for the mission they were going into to not care about how they felt and how they felt was irrelevant because the mission was way more important than how you feel. Now, I thank God that, as Jesus said, the kingdom of God is taken by violent people. We're not talking bang, bang, hand grenades. We're talking about men and women who have come to the point in life where unless they're given a mission that requires something much bigger than themselves, they feel like they're rotting. They feel like they're rotting. I've talked to more than one Christian in my lifetime as they got near death. And their comment was, is this all there is? Is this all there is? I knew exactly what they were saying. That's the sound of a man or a woman that never was drafted into something that was so much bigger than them that they actually began to find out who they were. I want to suggest to you that you may have no clue who you are and that your Christian experience has not yet allowed you to get into a mission because you're surrounded with an ideology that says Christianity and Jesus are here to make you feel good about yourself and good about life. I'd like to suggest to you that feeling good about yourself and good about life is a prize most held by those who've gone through the pressure of God bringing us to a point where what our life is really matters. And we know it matters because of the price that has already been paid, not just by Jesus, 
but by Jesus reproducing a similar price in your life because that's part of his agenda for who you are. I don't know what is going to have to happen to the pastors, the teachers in the body of Christ. Especially if our primary purpose is to grow a big church. I want to tell you, my dear brother and sister, growing a big church is doing squat. Come on. It, is, it is not going to produce just because it's big. It is not going to produce spiritual soldiers and spiritual partakers of Christ's nature who was alive because he was crucified. He prayed, Lord, if there's another way, let it be. But if this is the only way to produce replicas of my life, then bring that cross on. Bring that cross on. So what am I saying? What am I saying? I believe the heart of what God called us to do is to engage him so that he becomes the center line and his mission for us becomes the center line of the way we interpret scripture. Because scripture on one level is all over the place. It is comprehensive. It's dealing with this and this and this and this and this and this. All of which is designed to be interpreted out of your center line. Holy Spirit, help us in here right now. Because you need to be able to hear what I'm saying. We've got tons of confusion in the body of Christ. And we don't have a center line out there. I know some do. But generally, we don't have a center line that this thing about Jesus is that he didn't save me to take me to heaven he saved me to bring his life experience into me. As Peter said in 2 Peter 4 and 5, he, he died for you so that you and I can become partakers of his divine nature. That puts the center line of the cross in the very center of my life because it shows me the model of what Jesus himself went through as the son of man, the prototype of you and I, the prototypical human being in God's new creation is somebody even like Jesus who though he was a son, yet learned the obedience and value by the things he suffered. Now, I am not a closing. Some of you are saying, thank God. <laughs> Everybody is not equally called to do certain stuff. I'm not here to recruit SEAL teams, although I hope there's some SEALs in here. I mean that spiritually, very much. I mean that because we need a ton of them. Yeah. We need men and women who are going to be willing to die for the gospel. If this thing, if the heat is declared by the enemy, if, and we don't know yet, I'm not getting into eschatology or we don't really know how far it's going to get pressed. But if it's getting pressed far enough that they're trying to steal our children and we're paying that we're taxing and paying for them to steal our children, if that doesn't wake us up, what is it going to take? Now, you touch my children, I guarantee you, you will not like me. 
I am so offended by going after the children in our public schools and telling us as fathers and mothers, as parents, they are going to tell us what they're going to teach our children. I don't think so. I don't think so. Don't wake me up. You won't like me. So here's what I'm trying to say. All of us, all of us need to be grounded in the love of Jesus Christ. All of us need to be grounded in the scriptures. All of in this new birth, as we are growing, all of us need to be grounded. But there is a day when the Holy Spirit is saying, OK, you're grounded enough. I can begin to talk to you like an adult. I can begin to require from you training that you won't like. And if, if some spiritual leader doesn't explain to you that growth is going to require pain and death to self and discipline, if they don't explain that to you, that will be something you rebuke in the name of Jesus You'll view it as spiritual warfare and you will never get out of your diapers. You'll never get out into, into what Jesus Christ died to give you your real identity in him. Now I know Terry believes this. I know Dudley believes it for sure. I know Roland believes this. But the challenge is, what adjustments do we have to make in what we're saying in order to get believers and those we influence to see that at some time, the Holy Spirit, who really does love you, he loves you enough to prepare you to fulfill your destiny. God bless you. Yeah.